Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong, but we think that there's no systematic rule to our mistake. Decades of research in behavioral economics and social psychology suggest otherwise. It suggests that we have an optimism bias. And by that I mean that we expect the future to be better than the past and the present. We expect the future to be slightly better than it ends up being. In a recent survey, 76% of the population said that they were optimistic about the future of their own families, but only 30% were optimistic about the future of other families. And this is really an important point, because we're optimistic about ourselves. We're optimistic about our kids, we're optimistic about our families, but we're not so optimistic about the guy sitting next to us. And we're somewhat pessimistic about where the country is going and about the future of our fellow citizens. In fact, we tend to think that we are better than our fellow citizens. This is called the superiority illusion, um, and it was observed as far back as um, the writings of the French Renaissance writer Michel de Montaigne, when he said, I consider myself an average man, except for the fact that I consider myself an average man. And he was right, because we do consider ourselves above average, and we think that our future will be better, will be above average. Um, and this is quite a universal phenomenon. My first study on optimism was indeed carried out in the US, but since then, all of my studies in the past five years were carried out either here in the UK, other places in Europe, or the Middle East, where I'm from. In all of these places, we find an optimism bias. There's no difference in the bias of an American or a British person. The difference is, is in our culture. But my studies, as well as studies of many, many, many other people, show that optimism crosses borders. It crosses race, it crosses gender, it crosses age. Young kids are optimistic when they think about the future, and you think that as um, we grow older, we gain experience, and therefore we'll become more realistic. But the data shows that, if anything, older adults are more optimistic than younger adults. There's some studies showing that other animals seem to have an optimism bias as well. And scientists taught birds that when they hear a short auditory tone, they should press a blue lever. And if they do that, they get an immediate food reward. So the animals are quite happy with their uh, food rewards, and this is a positive outcome. Then they taught them, when they hear a long auditory tone, they should press a red lever, and if they do that, then they will get a reward, but only after a delay. Now, the birds had to get it right, because if they didn't get it right, they would get nothing at all. Now the question was, what will happen when they hear a medium tone, a six-second tone? Will they press the blue lever, suggesting that they expect a positive outcome, or would they press a red lever, suggesting that they expect a negative outcome? And most of the birds insisted on pressing the blue lever, suggested that they expected to get the immediate reward. And even if you went up to seven seconds and eight seconds, still a large proportion of the birds continued pressing the blue lever. So this suggests that some sort of an optimism bias may exist in other animals, even in birds, which diverged from the evolutionary branch of humans very, very early on. But not all humans are optimistic or have an optimism bias. Studies show again and again that about 80% of the population have an optimism bias. So what's going on with the remaining 20%? Well, it seems that a large proportion of that 20% tend to be individuals suffering from depression. There's a tight correlation between depression symptoms and pessimism. 
this is a study that was conducted by Strunk and Al. And what he shows here is a correlation between the optimism bias on your y-axis, so how much you expect things to be better than they end up being by recording expectations and then outcomes, and depression symptoms on the x-axis. And here on the very left, you have the healthy individuals. And they have a slight optimism bias. The people who don't have any bias at all tend to be the mildly depressed. So people with mild depression are a bit more realistic in their expectations than healthy individuals. And people who have severe depression on the very right over there um, tend to have a pessimistic bias. So they expect the future to be slightly worse than it ends up being. So most of us healthy individuals do have this optimism bias, but we're not aware of it because the optimism bias is an illusion. It's a game that our brain plays on us, and it's only one of the many games that the brain plays on us. And I'm going to give you an example from the visual domain just to show you how we can be easily tricked. So look at the photo here and tell me what you see. Let's test this perception. Looks quite different, doesn't it? So upright, it's quite clear that this is a grotesque image, and it's not quite right. The way that you um, make this illusion is you invert the eyes and the mouth while keeping the face the same. Now, this way, we can see exactly what's going on because our brain is very good at perceiving upright faces. We do it all the time. We have upright faces next to us everywhere. But we're not so used to perceiving upside down faces. Our brain is not very good at that, and that's why we're deceived. And even though I show you the illusion unfold, you're going to be deceived every single time. The same with the optimism bias. We think that we see the future in a realistic manner, but we're actually deceived. How do we maintain optimism in the face of reality? This was a great puzzle to us because according to every psychological uh, theory and uh, theories in neuroscientists, in neuroscience, the assumption was that when the world doesn't fit our expectations, we alter them, meaning we alter our expectations, not the world. If that is so, over time, we should become realistic and not maintain this bias. But that wasn't the case. We conducted an, exper an experiment where we had um, people come into our lab, and we asked them to estimate how likely it was that they will encounter uh, negative events, such as, for example, how likely are you to suffer from Alzheimer's? How likely are you to get divorced? How likely are you to suffer from cancer? And then we gave them information about the likelihood of these events happening to someone like them, the same age, living in the same place. And then we asked them again. What we wanted to know is whether people will take the information that we gave them in order to change their estimate, to change their beliefs. And indeed, they did. But only when the information that we gave them was better than they expected. If someone said, my likelihood to suffer from cancer is 50%, and we told them, you know, the average likelihood is much better, it's only 30%. Well, then the next time around, they would say, well, yeah, maybe it's only 35%, you're right. But if someone started off saying, my likelihood from suffering from cancer is about 10%, and we said, you know, the average likelihood is much worse, it's about 30%, the next time around, they would say, mm, still think it's about 11%. <laughs> Now, it's not that they didn't learn. They did learn. But they learned much less when the information was bad news versus when the information was good news. Because when the information was good news, they said, well, that's very much related to me. But when the information was bad news, they said, yeah, that's not about me. I um, eat healthily. I exercise. It's other people's risk. So how can that be? How could that be? Well, it turns out it's related to something that scientists call prediction errors. Prediction errors are the difference between what you expect and what transpires. So let's say, imagine you're in a restaurant and you're about to order dessert. You order a chocolate cake and you imagine you're going to get something like that. That's what you expect. But then the waiter comes and he gives you this. Now, the difference between what you predicted and what you got is called the prediction error. And our brain takes note of prediction errors all the time. We're not aware of it, but it, it computes these errors all the time, and it uses those to learn from the environment and to try and assess how good it is at predicting what will happen in the future. 
Now, we didn't give our um, subjects desserts, we gave them information. And what we wanted to know whether the brain was coding for the difference between their expectations and the information that we gave them. And what we found was that part of the brain, called the uh, left inferior frontal gyrus, was coding for how good the news was relative to what they expected. And it was doing so perfectly well, whether if you were extreme optimist, a mild optimist, or a pessimist. Everyone was coding good information. On the other side of the brain, the right inferior frontal gyrus was coding for bad news. How worse was the information relative to what people expected? And it wasn't doing a very good job. And the more optimistic someone was, the less likely this part of the brain was to code for bad news. And that's what was the difference between the extreme optimist, the mild optimist, and the mildly pessimist. Because if you're not coding for this unexpected bad news, you don't learn from it, and therefore you remain with those rose-tinted glasses. So now we said, let's try and see if we can interfere with the activity of these brain regions in order to make people more optimistic or less optimistic. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, and this is my collaborator, Ryota Kanai, at University College London. And what he's doing is um, he's transmitting a small magnetic pulse through the scalp of this individual into his left inferior frontal gyrus. And by doing that, he's interfering with the activity of that brain region for about half an hour. After that, everything goes back to normal. We found that their optimism bias grew. It became even larger than what we find normally. And what happened when we interfered with a part of the brain that codes for good news? In that case, the optimism bias disappeared. In fact, it became slightly pessimistic. In fact, the data of these people looked a little bit like data from the clinically depressed. We had clinically depressed individuals in our lab, and we found that their ability to learn from good news and bad news was the same. There was no bias. So here's a question. Would we want to do this? Do we want to take off people's rose-tinted glasses? Well, some people say yes. Some people say the secret to happiness is low expectations. If you don't expect greatness, if you don't expect success, if you don't expect love, well, you're not going to be disappointed when you don't get it. And you're going to be slightly surprised when things go right. Two psychologists, Marshall and Brown, for example, um, asked their students, what grade do you think you're going to get in a midterm exam? So some people thought they're going to get really good grades, and some people thought they're going to fail. And it turned out that the people thought, who thought they were going to do poorly, when they actually ended up getting an A, they didn't feel better than the people who expected greatness. And when they failed, they didn't feel less bad or less sad than the people who expected to do well. In fact, whatever the outcome was, people with low expectations felt worse. Why is that? Well, it turns out it's about how we interpret the outcome. The people who expected to do well when they did well, they thought, I'm a genius, and therefore, I'm going to do well again and again and again. They attributed the outcome to their own ability. The people with low expectations had less of a tendency to think that it was their own ability for which they got an A. And therefore, they thought, next time, reality will catch up with me, and I won't do as well. And when they failed, when they failed, people with high expectations said, it's not about me, the exam wasn't fair, or I didn't study enough, but next time I will, and then I will do better. While the people with low expectations um, tended to see it more about their own ability and therefore expected to fail and fail again. So lowering your expectations doesn't make you happy. In fact, having high expectations make you happy at least at the time of anticipation, because if you think things are going to be good, well, you're happy at that moment. The anticipation of a good thing brings us so much joy that we're actually willing to pay for it. Um, this is something that was shown by behavioral economist George Lowenstein in the US. Um, he asked people, imagine that you're going to get a kiss from a celebrity. How much are you willing to pay to get a kiss if this kiss was given immediately, in an hour, in uh, one day, in three days, in a year, or in 10 years? 
And what he found was that people were willing to pay the most if they got the kiss in three days. They were willing to wait three days in order to get the kiss. Why is that? Well, if you get the kiss immediately, it's over and done with. But if you have three days to think about it, get excited, feel all jittery in your stomach, people were willing to pay for that. Now, they're not willing to, to wait a year or 10 years. I mean, God knows what will happen to the celebrity then. But a little bit of waiting time is something that they all wanted. Now, George said, how much are you willing to pay to avoid a very, very large electric shock? People were willing to pay the most to avoid an electric shock in 10 years. The knowledge that something bad is going to happen makes you feel really bad. And people wanted to avoid this negative feeling of dread, and they were willing to pay for it. Now, optimists are people who expect more kisses in their future and less shocks. So optimism changes subjective reality, but it also changes objective reality. Optimism has been related to achievement in um, sports, in academia, in uh, politics. And maybe the biggest um, benefit of optimism is to our physical health. It's been shown again and again that optimism is related to um, longer life, healthier life, and shorter recovery time. Um, two reasons for that. One is if you have positive expectations of the future, stress and anxiety is reduced, and that is obviously good for our physical health. The second reason is that if you expect to be healthy and you expect to recover, you're more likely to take the actions needed. And it's also good for our personal life. So although optimists are not less likely to divorce, they're more likely to remarry. In the world of words of Samuel Johnson, remarriage is the, hope, uh, the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> but there are, of course, dangers to optimism. So if you underestimate your risks, you're less likely to take the actions needed to protect yourself. You might not go to medical screenings because you think you're going to be OK or not buy insurance. Now, on balance, the data shows that the positive um, aspects outweigh the negative. But sometimes, the balance tips the other way. And I think if we're aware of the optimism bias, the good news, it's not going to shatter. It's a bit like the visual illusion, where you understood what was going on, you were still tricked. So understanding and knowing about the optimism bias doesn't mean that we will take our rose glasses, glasses um, off. But it does mean that then we can take actions to protect ourselves. We can go to medical screenings, even though we think we're going to be OK, or put an umbrella in our bag, even if we think that it's not going to rain. Some of the experiments you mentioned are kind of belief independent. It, you know, you, certainly lots of perceptual illusions that you use it an, as an analogy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what you think is there, you still see something else. Yeah. Uh, is there something different about the nature of optimism that means that knowing about it will stop you being optimistic? It's not just knowing about it, it's knowing about it and then taking actions. So actions can be in the level of government, in the level of companies, and in the individual level as well. Um, just to give you a very simple example, um, vertigo. So pilots um, sometimes think that they're going um, down where they're actually going up. And they, will s they still feel like that, but they learn to um, take note of the instruments, mm. which tell them what is actually happening. So they're fooled, mm. but... <laughs> If there's guards there, mm. they can actually then take the correct action. Yeah. A couple of times you refer to the part of the brain that codes for negative information or the part of the brain that codes for positive. Mm. And the book is full of references to various different parts of the brain and, and the principal function they play. But m often that felt to me like far too strong a reduction. Um, is that a sort of necessary heuristic to tell the story or it, do you really think that single parts of the brain do something as complex as pessimism or op optimism? No. So uh, absolutely, there's no one part of a brain that does anything. And, and both in the book and in any um, verbal conversation, I make sure not to say that. So for example, what um, I showed here is a part of the brain that we found to code for negative or positive information. That's not all it does. And no, and it's not the well. only one. Yeah, so for example, we found one, I've showed one area that codes for positive information, and we found three others in the task that we did. Right. We don't suggest in any way that that part, its function sure. is to code for positive uh, yeah. information, um, and neither do any other of the parts that I mentioned. So it's sure. not, yeah, you yeah. know, um, every part of the brain does a lot of different things, and it interacts with many other parts of the brain yeah. all the time. Everything is a system. No region works on its own.